Greetings, and welcome back to Mavanrinia Studio, here in Leitrim's Iron Mountains. If you're new here, my name is Harriet, and today I will be sharing another Drawloween illustration in my sketchbook. So we're just past Halloween, and out of the 31 Drawloween illustrations, I only managed to get eight of them done and it was just the first eight as I got wildly distracted by rebuilding my website. It felt kind of pressing to me because my previous website kept crashing and it was just getting too much downtime that I really needed to address it and I'm really happy to say that it's now online so it's been a lot of work but I finally have it online. I have a few little tweaks to iron out but for the most part I'm happy to have it live now. With this, my Drawloween 2020 is going to be an 8 video series. So this is the third video in the series. The prompt list I'm using is by Mab Graves and it's hashtag Mab's Drawloween Club 2020. This prompt was Changeling and a changeling is based on the belief that fairies steal babies or very small children and would leave a changeling in their place. A changeling would be their own children sometimes, a fairy child, and sometimes these changelings could be an old senile fairy, some 200 years old. I recently, quite synchronistically, stumbled upon a version of a changeling story in the Brothers Grimm, I'm reading the complete works of Brothers Grimm to my six-year-old son. It's always great finding a book that is interesting to read but is also suitable for my child, although I do find myself having to explain some of the sentences as I go as the language is quite old-fashioned and also some of the parts of the stories I find myself censoring it or just not reading that bit and it seems a little bit too violent and a little bit grim because some of the stories they have an oddness to them that doesn't always seem quite suitable for children. The story I immediately recognised was a brewery of eggshells that reminded me of the Irish story from the Thomas Crofton Croker collection which was published in 1824 and was translated a year later published in the Brothers Grimm in 1825. There is actually lots of small mentions of changelings in the Brothers Grimm the Brothers Grimm is an anthology of stories which they collected from many sources. The works were funded by the then German government and they rewrote them to re-present them to a new middle class ideal in an attempt to condition values and shape a new forming middle class and they're quite simplistically written. You wouldn't need to be overly educated to understand them and follow the happenings of the story. So that's why they have that kind of childlike quality, why they're so easy to read to children. They just have this very simplistic formula to them, but they weren't originally written with children in mind. They were written for people who weren't educated enough to read anything more complex the story of the changeling in Crofton Croker's collection was appropriated by the Brothers Grimm and the one in the Brothers Grimm of course takes on a much more simplistic version which is also oddly grouped within a set of free stories which is called the Little Elves and this also includes the elves and the shoemaker and a story about a peasant girl who was whisked away for seven years but to which seemed to her like a day and this is very similar to other stories I've read such as Rip Van Winkle. These folk stories are part of a very old tradition in Ireland and it was a widespread belief fairies and otherworldly creatures that people actually believed the fairies would come and swap children. This idea perhaps was so prevalent because back, I'll call it in the olden days, as these were written at the Brewery of Eggshells back in early 1800s and the story is from a much, much earlier piece of folklore. Even in Shakespeare's Midsummer's Night Dream, there is references to the changeling child. Some of these stories were used to cover up uncomfortable truths, a way to say that a child that was born maybe ugly or moronic or deformed was not their own child and their own child had been spirited away to fairyland or the phantom island of Tirnanog. 
Back then, a married woman's sense of self-worth was very much attached to how well they could birth a child and how fine the child would be. So if a child was less than perfect, a woman might get very depressed. And I think this kind of folk story comes out of that. In a time of mental turbulence, it might be easier to believe the fairies have come and switched the child than to face the truth of the trouble with your own child. There are lots of variations as well of these changeling stories. Another common one was of an inanimate object, like a log of wood that had been bewitched so it seemed to be human. And I think that this also is from maybe the loss of a child, being unable to accept the truth that the child had died and that there's this inanimate object which took the child's place. And I think this story as well perhaps came from a mother's grieving and the mother does not want to accept the loss of the child, that um, an inanimate object would, would be reappropriated with this belief that the child is not dead, that the fairies have, have the child. And they held on to this inanimate object with the hopes that the child would be brought back, the fairies would bring the child back. In Irish traditions, a number of tests were derived to establish whether or not the child was a changeling. Some of the worst of these perhaps would be to lay the child or the baby on a shovel over the fire and repeat the words, burn, 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 if of the devil, burn. But if of the gods and saints, be safe from harm. It's told that if the child was a changeling, it would immediately rush up the chimney, for the belief was held that fire is the greatest enemy of every sort of phantom. Instances of the tests being applied to children had been reported right into the 20th century. Another horrible method was suggested to beat the child until it screams of pain and fright, to call back the fairies to reclaim it. A much kinder and less horrible than either of these being the belief that a changeling could be made to reveal its identity by crossing it over a stream because they hate water, or trying to make it laugh as they are only joyful when something evil happens. According to these Irish traditions, any child not baptised or a child that is admired too much could run the risk of being carried off by the fairies. A way to ensure protection over this happening would be to hang a pair of scissors over the child's bed or lay an article of his father's clothing over it while it sleeps. The Brewery of Eggshells is perhaps the most famous Irish changeling story and the original version from the Thomas Crofton Croker collection and I thought it would be nice to read it. It's quite a short story. The Brewery of Eggshells now Mrs. Sullivan fancied that her youngest child had been changed by fairy theft, and certainly appearances warranted such a conclusion. For in one night, her healthy blue-eyed boy had become a shriveled up into almost nothing, and never ceased squalling and crying. This naturally made poor Mrs. Sullivan very unhappy, and all her neighbours by way of comforting her said that her own child was beyond any kind of doubt with the good people, and that one of themselves was put in his place. Mrs. Sullivan of course would not disbelieve what everyone had told her, but she did not wish to harm the thing, for although its face was withered, the body wasted away to a mere skeleton, it was still a strong resemblance to her own boy. She therefore couldn't find it in her to roast it alive on the griddle, or burn its nose off with red hot tongues, or to throw it out in the snow, or on the roadside, notwithstanding these, a several like proceedings were strongly recommended for the recovery of her own child. One day, who should Mrs. Sullivan and meet but a cunning woman, well known about the country for the name Ella Leah or Grey Ellen, for she has the gift, however she got it, of telling where the dead were, and what was good for the rest of their souls, could charm away warts and wens, and do many great wonderful things of the same nature. You're in grief this morning, Mrs. Sullivan, were the first words Ellen Leah said to her. You may say that, Ellen, said Mrs. Sullivan, and in good cause I have grief, for there my own fine child, whipped off from me out of his cradle, without much of a leave or ask of pardon, and an ugly donny bit of shriveled up fairy put in his place. No wonder then that you see me in grief, Ellen. 
Small blame to you, Mrs. Sullivan, said Ellen Leah. But are you sure it is fairy? Sure, echoed Mrs. Sullivan. Sure enough, I am to my sorrow. And can I doubt my own two eyes? Every mother's soul must feel for me. Will you take an old woman's advice, said Ellen Leah, fixing her wild, mysterious gaze upon the unhappy mother. And after a pause, she added, But may you be, call it foolish. Can you get me back my child, my own child? Ellen, Mrs. Sullivan said with great energy. If you do, I bid you return, Ellen Lee. You know, Mrs. Sullivan was silent with expectation, but Ellen continued, put down that big pot full of water on the fire and boil it like mad and then get a dozen new laid eggshells and break them. Keep the shells and throw away the rest. When that is done, put the shells in a pot of boiling water and you will soon know whether it is your own boy or a fairy. If you find that it is a fairy in the cradle, take the red hot poker and cram it down the ugly throat and you will not have much trouble with him after that, I promise you. And home went Mrs. Sullivan and did as Ellen Leah desired. She put the pot on the fire and plenty of turf under it and set the water boiling at such a rate. If there ever water was red hot, it surely was. The child was lying for a wonder quite easily and quiet in the cradle, every now and then cocking his eye that would twinkle as keen as a star in frosty night over the great fire and the big pot upon it. And he looked on with great attention, Mrs. Sullivan breaking the egg, putting down the eggshell to boil. At last he asked with a voice of a very old man, What are you doing, Mammy? Mrs. Sullivan's heart, as she said to herself, was up in her mouth ready to choke her at hearing the child speak. But she contrived to put the poker on the fire and to answer without making any wonder at the words, I'm brewing a vic, my son. And what are you brewing, Mammy? said the little imp, whose supernatural gift of speech now proved beyond question that it was a fairy substitute. I wish the poker was red, thought Mrs. Sullivan, but it was a large one and it took a long time for heating. So she determined to keep him in talk until the poker was in its proper state to thrust down his throat and therefore repeated the question. It is what I'm brewing, eh, Vic? she said. You want to know? Yes, mummy. What are you brewing? returned the fairy. Eggshells. A vic, said Mrs. Sullivan. Oh, shrieked the imp, starting up in the cradle and clapping his hands together. I'm fifteen hundred years in the world, and I never saw a brewery of eggshells before. The poker by this time was quite red, and Mrs. Sullivan seized it and ran furiously towards the cradle, but somehow or other her foot slipped, and she fell flat to the floor, and the poker flew out of her hand to the other end of the house. However, she got up without much loss of time and went to the cradle intending to pinch the wicked thing that was in it and put it into the pot of boiling water. But when she went there, she saw her own child in a sweet sleep of his own soft round arms resting upon the pillow. His features were as placid as in their response he'd never been disturbed, save the rosy mouth which was moved with a gentle, regular breathing. Who can tell the feeling of a mother when she looks upon her sleeping child? And why should I therefore endeavour to describe those of Mrs. Sullivan at again beholding her long lost boy? The fountains of her heart overflowed with the excess of joy as she wept, tears trickling silently down her cheek. Nor did she strive to check them. They were tears not of sorrow but of joy. So that was A Brewery of Eggshell from the Thomas Crofton Croker Collection of Irish Folklore and Fairy Tales. So the way I've interpreted the prompt, I have drawn a mother holding the fairy baby in a swaddle. She has this bemused expression on her face and in the window behind her, there's the head of another goblin-like fairy just peeping in at her and his own kin. And I've done this with my glass dip pen. I did a quick pencil sketch and then inked it with black Indian ink. And I used a white Indian ink marker by Faber-Castell, these are the pit markers. So I did all the white first onto the black outline work and then I decided to bring the colour in and I found that the marker pen went quite easily onto the surface of this white pen, trying to find very subtle tone shifts so I could do maybe better blending with these pens because I'm still finding my way with them. I'd done her dress in a pale mauve and she has brown hair. I did some accents on top with white gel pen. 
I really like this piece. I think it has a real storybook quality to it, which I like. I think the colour scheme is quite serene. So we're coming to the end of my time lapse now, and I do hope you enjoyed it. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Do have a wonderful and inspiring week, and I hope to see you all again soon for another video. Bye bye.